Now, one of the first things is, why in the world do we have to understand OSI? Why is it so important that the seven-layer model can help us out? Well, it helps a lot with troubleshooting. It makes it a lot easier for us to be able to go through and figure out where the problem is so we don't spend time running down a rabbit hole that <laughs> isn't broken. So um, it's a seven-layer model. Starts with the application layer, presentation, session, transport network, data, and physical. And the data layer is actually data link layer. But eh, we've got to make it fit on the slide. You do need to memorize the order, maybe not necessarily for this exam, but for um, a bunch of other Microsoft exams if you're going for MCITP. Also, when you're buying hardware, you'll frequently see to it referred to by the layer number or by the layer name. And we put a little mnemonic device on here. All people seem to need data processing or please do not throw sausage pizza away. And what we're talking about here is the layers and their corresponding numbers. So if you go all people seem to need data processing, it's the first letter of each of these layers. Now personally, I like to memorize it from layer one up. Please do not throw sausage pizza away. And the reason is, is that way I don't get confused on which is layer one and which is layer seven. Now, of course, if you've been doing this, even for a little bit, it'll become pretty much second nature, knowing that layer one is a physical layer, layer two is a data link layer, layer three is a network layer, layer four is a transport layer, and then we take all these up here and kind of lump them all together, especially when we're using TCP. However, in your book, they go through and they talk about what each of these particular services do. And the idea, back in the old days, there were two major computer manufacturers. You had IBM and Digital Equipment Corporation. And when you went out and spent hundreds of thousands of dollars, and back then that was a heck of a lot of money, well, it's a heck of a lot of money now, on computer equipment, you would buy, let's say, you bought IBM. You would buy an IBM computer, you'd buy IBM monitors, you'd buy IBM printers, you'd buy IBM paper. And it only worked with IBM. If you had engineering on an IBM machine and you had accounting on a digital equipment corporation machine, the two could not talk to each other because everything was proprietary. Everything. Like I said, even the paper was proprietary. So the powers that be, thank goodness, said, you know, this is, this is silly. I spent all these hundreds of thousands of dollars and I have islands of information where we can't share it. So they decided to come up with a standard that abstracted everything so that if you have an application that writes to the application, application program interface, the API. So if I wrote a program that needed network services, they only had to match the API calls handled by application. And then application knew how to communicate with presentation. Presentation knew how to communicate with application above it and session below it. So what I can do is, as a hardware manufacturer, I don't care what applications you're running. As long as I match the requirements for the, the uh, physical layer and possibly the data link layer, I don't have to worry whether you're running SharePoint, Internet Explorer, Minecraft server. It is completely irrelevant. Uh, back in the days when they were doing these video games that were playing over the network, they would have to write the protocol stack as part of the program. But now all they do is they write them to the API for the application layer, and all the other layers handle communications back and forth. Now, you may notice that we have sort of a theme here. And what we're doing is we're saying, look, as long as you are able to talk to the layer above you, directly above you, and the layer directly below you, you can completely ignore what everything else goes on. That is why your programs work whether you're on a wireless environment, whether you're on an Ethernet environment, whether you're on saline coated kite string. They actually had Ethernet going over saline coated kite string at MIT. It is completely irrelevant because each layer handles the encapsulation, transporting the information down to the next layer, all the way across the network and then back up these various layers to communicate. They do have in your book on page 135 an explanation of each of the layers. And we're not going to spend a whole lot of time in here, but the application layer provides network services to any applications. They write to the API, and the user processes, as long as they are written according to the standards associated with that application layer, they have network access. They don't care how the stuff gets there. They don't care what kind of hardware you have. They just know that it is going to simply work. 
The presentation layer goes down and it does something very interesting. What it does is it handles all of our encryption services. So if I'm doing secure socket layers, or if I'm going through and I'm doing, uh, well, any type, IPsec or any type of encryption, it's going to be handled by the presentation layer. And there's more stuff in there as well. But if you go HTTP versus HTTPS, HTTPS is secure socket layer that's handled by the presentation layer. The session layer is going to go through and it's going to establish a connection between the two systems. For example, iSCSI, if you're talking to a, a storage area network, remote procedure calls, um, all of this. It just says, you know what, I don't care what application you're running at the top. I don't care what the other system happens to be running. But if we're going to use the remote procedure calls like you see with Exchange or something like that, I can address it and then remote procedure calls are handled at the, present, at the session layer here and they're handled at the session layer on the remote machine. And this is an important concept. When you have a layer, what the layer does is physically and logically it connects to the layer above and the layer below. But what it does is it receives the data. It doesn't know. It doesn't care. It has no idea what is inside the data. But what it does is it adds its own header and sometimes footer to that particular message, hands it down to the next layer. That layer adds whatever headers or footers it needs, so on and so on. When it's received on the other side, what the other side's going to do is it's going to go through and it's going to de-encapsulate this information. So the physical layer de-encapsulates the headers and footers for the physical layer, whether it's Ethernet or whatever. Data link layer de-encapsulates the headers and footers, hands it up to the network layer. Network layer de-encapsulates the headers and footers, and so on and so on and so on. Until all the way at the top, you have the application layer de-encapsulates the wrappers that it needs and hands it up to the application API, or up to the application itself. So the first three layers just pretend it's application. In fact, when you look at the TCP protocol stack, it is going to be kind of lumped together as a general application layer. It really starts to get interesting when we finally get into um, this layer here, which is layer four. This is our transport layer. Now, what the transport layer is going to do is it's going to determine in a TCP stack, do you need connection-oriented services or do you need connectionless oriented services? Now, when I say connectionless, I don't mean you're not connected to the network. You're not connected to another machine. What I'm saying is, is that that layer of the protocol stack doesn't check to see if you have receipt. It doesn't go through and say, did you get it, did you get it, did you get it, if you're using connectionless protocol. The two protocols that we have here are going to be TCP and UDP, Transport uh, Transmission Control Protocol and User Datagram Protocol. TCP sends everything registered mail. It'll go through and it'll number everything and it sends it out and the other side has to acknowledge it. And If I don't receive the acknowledgments, I'll go ahead and retransmit it and we deal with that back and forth and back and forth. Which means it's great if you have a large file and you have to ensure that it's going to get there. A great example would be um, FTP. I'm transferring a megabyte and megabyte and megabyte file up there and we need to ensure that it is received reliably. So as I send it to you, you send a packet with the header and footer back at your transport layer that says, yes, I have received packet 23. I'm looking for packet 24. And then I say, OK, here's 24, 25, 26. I send it to you. And as it winds its way through the network, it may be reordered. You may have segments that are dropped. And then when the other side receives it, they say, well, I have received up to packet 23. I'm expecting 24, 24 hasn't made it yet. And the other side says, oh, man, you haven't received 24? OK, I'll just retransmit it. So that provides a reliable communication session for large block of data, and you want the protocol stack to handle it. UDP, on the other hand, user datagram protocol, is connectionless. Connectionless means that I send it to you, I tell you which one it is, but uh, I don't care if it gets there or not. It's not up to me as UDP to ensure that it has been delivered. Great, and if the packet gets dropped, which happens, what do we do? Well, <laughs> that's up to the application. For example, we're sending out audio and video. And if I had to retransmit every time we dropped an audio and video packet, I would be in here doing the Vogue. It would be all spotty and droppy. And you know, when we're using video streaming or audio streaming, and it's real time, what we're going to do is we're going to say, eh, so what if we missed a packet or two? That just means that we're going to move from this frame to this frame, and we're not going to go back. 
UDP is great if you want fast communication. For example, when you're talking to a DHCP server, I want the IP address subnet mask and default gateway. And if I send out that request, I send it out via UDP, and if that DHCP server doesn't hear it, I'm requesting the IP address, I just send it again. It's small packets of information, but that also means I don't have all these acknowledgments, I don't have all this overhead, I don't have all this tracking, so it's really, really fast. That's why UDP is a preferred method of audio and video transmission. It's also the preferred method for DHCP. There's even a trivial file transfer protocol called TFTP that allows you to do file transfers, and if the file doesn't get there, <laughs> we just retransfer it. If you have a Cisco router, and you have your configuration file, which is usually K in size, 100K, you know, 200K, whatever, I am not going to have all the overhead associated with TCP. Did you get it? Yes, I did. Did you get it? Yes, I did. Let me transmit. Okay, here we go. Now, I'm just going to say, look, let me grab the stuff. Oh, I didn't get it. Well, just give it to me again. So it's up to the application on how it handles reliability. So when they're saying it's a non-reliable protocol, it doesn't mean it's not reliable, you shouldn't use it. No, it just means it's fast. It doesn't have all the overhead associated with TCP. Now, I'm not saying TCP is bad. When I am transmitting, for example, at the end of class, I take this and I put the video file and I upload it to the server so they can get it out there for you for replay, and it's a big file. It's a big file, and I want it transmitted reliably, so I use TCP. So how do you decide if you use TCP or UDP? The application tells you. Remember, the application uses the APIs and says, yes, I want this to be reliable, and so when it finally gets down to the transport layer, the transport layer says, well, are you supposed to be using TCP or UDP? Oh, TCP. Well, okay. What upper layer service do I address this to? In other words, what application sort of thing am I supposed to send it to? Well, send it to port 80. Port 80 is HTTP. Behind that door is an HTTP server saying, oh, give me that request. Okay, here we go. And let me send it to you. And what port do you want it to be? And you can tell me. And as long as the applications agree, you know, we could have Doug Protocol. Doug Protocol uses port 8088. <laughs> Why not? And if I use 8088, as long as the other side knows that I'm using 8088, we'll be able to communicate and handle any type of redundancies or whatever that we need to make sure that the information's there. So I tend to block the first three layers, kind of together, and just call it application, even though it's not OSI compliant. Well, TCP is not OSI compliant. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But layer three, TCP, UDP, very important. Or layer four, let's talk about layer three. Layer three is the network layer. This is also a very important layer because this is where all of your routing occurs. If I have a network uh, packet, I have network information, and I want to send it to you, it is up to layer three to determine are you local to my network or are you remote. If you're local to my network, I just get the MAC address, the media access control address, that's burnt into your network card, and I address it directly to you. You receive it, away we go. But if you're remote, I have to figure out how to get it to your remote network. Now, normally, on desktop machines or server machines, any machine that's not a router, it says, well, if you're not local, I'm just going to send it to the default gateway. And that's what it does. It says, are you local? No, you're not. Okay, send it to the default gateway. And then after that, I don't care. Hand it to the router. The router has routing tables. The router figures it out, and it gets there. But layer three is where you determine are you local or are you remote. Now, how does it know? We'll show you that. It's called subnet mask and your IP address. Now, I talked about the MAC address, the media access control address. This is the addressing that we use when we're talking about layer two. Layer two is right above the physical layer, and depending upon your implementation, you're going to have a MAC address. Now, we're talking Ethernet networks. If you're going through and doing token ring, or you're going through and doing some of these wide area uh, protocols, then it's going to be a little bit different. But if you want to learn about that, come to our ICND1 class, and we'll spend uh, all sorts of hours teaching it to you. But what we have in here is we have a, an address that is physically burnt into the network card. So here I have my little network card, and on top of this little bitty chip right here, it's going to have the media access control address that is hard-coded in here. Now, the thing about layer two, 
Layer 2 doesn't know routing, doesn't care about routing. According to it, every communication that it has to take that has to take place occurs between two hosts, two machines, two network adapters that are on the same network segment. So when I try and communicate with you, I need your MAC address, your media access control. I don't understand IP addressing. That's a layer three thing. That's in the layer three header. To me, that's just data. But I do have to know your MAC address. And if I don't have your MAC address in my little memory table, what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to send out a broadcast and say, hey, IP address 131.107.5.4, what's your MAC address? We use a protocol called ARP. Wait a minute. You just you just use an IP address. I thought you said that it didn't care about IP addresses. It doesn't. What it does is it takes the IP header from layer three and just spits it out there. And if I'm using a protocol stack that's not using IP, maybe it's using Doug protocol and it's all based upon the color of your shirt, we would have the color of your shirt as the header inside of your MAC address. It says, hey, blue shirt, what's your MAC address? So it's all about matching whatever logical address you're using, and in most cases, in TCP, we're going to be using the IP address, to the physical address, which is your MAC address, matching them together, and then when I send a packet out, I address it to layer two and says, I'm looking for MAC address C13117, yada, 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 yada. That's sent out the network down the physical layer, who turns it into bits, ones and zeros, back and forth, electrical signals, or light, if I'm using fiber. It's received by the physical layer, turns it back into the data, doesn't care, hands it up to layer two, and layer two says, is this for my MAC address? Why, yes it is. I push it up to layer three, layer three says, is this for my IP address? Yes it is. Hands it up to layer four, is it TCP or UDP? Why, yes it is, it's TCP. What's the port number? Oh, it's port 80, and then I hand it into that big nebulous cloud known as the big block of layer seven, six, and five, and they hand it up to the application. So layers one through four are the important part. Now let's go ahead and talk about layer one. Layer one is a physical layer. A uh, great example of physical layer, I think I have one here. Here is one. It's a network cable. This is physical layer. It has wires, and the wires have to be certain things. We have to agree this pin is a receive line, this pin is a send line, this pin is for this, this pin is for that. We also have electrical signaling. What are our voltage levels? What is our delays? Is it serial communication? If I'm hooking you know, routers via a serial port, that is all handled by layer one. There's no addressing there, but we do need to be able to have some communication standards that lets us go back and talk back and forth to each other. So, we've gone through all of these layers. Let me go back here to the big, big one. There we go. Why do we care? Well, if you're going out to the market and you're looking for a layer three switch, wow, layer three switch. Well, I'm gonna teach you that a switch is a layer two device. But what happens at layer three? Questions and answers. What does IP do at layer three? Chat it in. Layer three. We know layer two is MAC addresses. Layer three uses IP addresses. But what is the primary function of layer three? Layer three handles. Dun, da, da, da. People are. Um, I'm waiting for the uh, <laughs> questions and answers to calm down. A lot of people type it in. Yes, layer three handles your routing. Are you local to me or are you remote to me? If you're local to me, I just send it to layer two, say find this MAC address, so away we go to the ultimate destination. If you're remote to me, I tell the, uh, the uh, layer two, find the MAC address of the default gateway. It goes out, ARPS gets a MAC address, sends a packet to that MAC address. That router receives it and says, hey, it's not for me. However, I'm a router. Do I know how to get to that IP address? And away it goes. It is to its MAC address but it's not to its IP address. So by understanding all of this, if I say I'm buying a layer two switch, what I'm doing is I'm saying, well, I'm buying a switch that also does routing. Switches can do routing as well. Yeah, cost you a little bit more. 
But if you have a Layer 2 device, that tells you it doesn't do routing. It is for a particular subnet. If you have a Layer 2 firewall, it means it's not going to look at routing. It's going to look at MAC address filtering. If you have a Layer 7 firewall, that means it's pulling those packets apart, and it's actually looking at the content of the data. Oh, wait a minute. This says Britney Spears. We don't allow Britney Spears traffic, and it tosses it out the door. I mean, there's add-ons that you can get with, uh, <laughs> with your browsers where you can put in names like Snooky or whatever, and uh, if, you, if it pulls in something that says the word Snooky, it won't display it on your browser. That's kind of a layer, actually, that's a layer 7 firewall. So the higher it is, the more intelligence it takes, also the longer it takes, and it's going to cost you a little bit more money.